As Ukrainian troops hold on to the ruined eastern city of Bakhmut, soldiers are preparing off the battlefield for a spring counteroffensive. These are training exercises taking place near the border with Belarus this weekend, but there's also a lot of training happening outside Ukraine. In Poland and in the UK, Canadian Armed Forces are part of Operation Unifier, which prepares Ukrainians for combat. Lieutenant Colonel Chris Boileau is the current task force commander for Operation Unifier, and I spoke with him earlier this morning about the latest training efforts and how they'll be translated onto the battlefield. Lieutenant Colonel Chris Boileau, good to see you again. Good morning, David. Uh, glad to be a part of this. So Canadian Armed Forces members have been training Ukrainian troops on, uh, on all sorts of skill sets, and the Leopard 2 tanks are among them. Um, can you just start with that and tell me how that training is going, what it looks like, and what the Ukrainians need? Um, so right now we have 25 members of the Canadian Armed Forces deployed as what we refer to as the Leopard training element. They're located in Western Poland. And as a matter of fact, they just finalized their uh, first serial of 105 Ukrainian soldiers who graduated and have since returned to the front lines um, as, part of their, uh, as part of their efforts to increase combat power for the spring. Yeah, and sort of take me through that. I know there's a lot of fixation on the Leopard 2s, and that's not the only thing that the Canadians are, are doing. But if we look particularly at that serial, that class of Ukrainian soldiers pulled off the front lines, now sent back there uh, with the Canadian training, they were in many cases already experienced on tanks. What, what's the purpose of this compressed course then? So... One of, the, one of the biggest issues or hurdles that we've had to face is the delta or the transition from Soviet era technology, including the T-64, T-72, really the, the main armored assets that the Ukrainians possess mm -hmm. um, as, far as, uh, as far as their military goes, and moving them to Western technology. Uh, in this case, we're talking about the Leopard 2A4s. There are significant differences. Um, top speed, their firepower armor package, overall capabilities are, you know, to put it mildly, night and day. Mm -hmm. So being able to take an even experienced tanker and then move them into more complex and uh, in-depth technology is a challenge. Um, one of the purposes of having a timetable that is so reduced is the urgency of the situation. Um, I don't believe that it would be remiss of me to say that the next few months are going to be extremely critical in generating combat power for both Ukraine and Russia to try to gain the upper hand as the weather changes. And so really that was our, our hard shoulder, mm -hmm. our, uh, our ability to provide quality and quantity in as short a period of time as possible and returning them to the front line. And so, you know, uh, you and I talked about this, in fact, a week ago when we were together in Poland, um, and a lot of people fixated, of course, on the Leopard 2s, that there's a spectacle to them, but that's not the only component of Op Unifier, of the Canadian training mission, which is happening in both Poland and in England. Uh, you know, if I, if I look at the totality of it, one thing that struck me, and perhaps you can elaborate on it a bit more, is that this is not a, a class that Canada designed and said, okay, Ukrainians, this is the thing that you're going to take. It's actually quite dynamic. Can you explain to me how, how things evolve based on what the Ukrainians are experiencing and seeing on the, on the front lines? Absolutely. So uh, I will say that uh, the Task Force Unifier has grown significantly in my time here. In the past six months approximately, we've doubled in size of our training elements. So one of the key pieces to that is feedback from the Ukrainians. Um, this is not something that Canada nor the West has imposed upon them. Um, the demand signal, both in terms of course content and length, is generated primarily from Kyiv and our conversations with the Ukrainian general staff. So from the United Kingdom training element where we're delivering basic infantry, basic soldier skills, to the engineer training element where we're providing basic sapper training. Uh, I, I would, I guess, refer to that as combat engineer training. Mm -hmm. 
to Such our, as learning how to diffuse a landmine or, or look for a booby trap or something like that. Yeah, so threat identification, demining, dealing with unexploded ordnance, breaching of obstacles, so uh, barbed wire uh, fortifications and, and clearing those um, those types of construction, uh, constructive uh, materials. Um, that's been that's been one of the biggest pieces there. And then our medical training element, which has been recently stood up, and that's providing basic uh, tactical mm -hmm. uh, combat casualty care um, and combat lifesaver skills. The Ukrainians, we've heard from a number of them, who've said that the Canadian and, and, and NATO-led uh, nations or NATO nations that have been delivering this kind of training, uh, that they are seeing a direct impact. It's not just with the equipment that's being delivered, that we've heard from them saying that, you know, in a, in a very practical level, the first aid training, the medical training, for instance, is saving lives, that the ability to uh, learn new skills for trying to um, detect booby traps in the kind of urban warfare that, that a lot of this fight is taking place on is saving lives. But I wonder if that if it goes the other way as well. Do you do you feel like deployed members of Op Unifier, Canadians, are learning from the Ukrainian experience as well? Absolutely. We would be mistaken if we were to suggest that this was a one-way street in terms of our learning. Uh, education has been occurring in both ways. We are very closely watching lessons learned. We're listening to the students and their feedback, not only from the lesson plans, but understanding what their lived experience is in Ukraine. Um, when we talk about, uh, just to give you uh, uh, an example, is just having to perform military functions and conduct operations with a pervasive drone threat, something that we have not ourselves encountered, um, so we've definitely taken a lot back from the Ukrainians to understand how we can adopt our own teaching and techniques uh, back in Canada. What, what do you want Canadians who, you know, uh, Op Unifier, is, you're the, the, the 14th incarnation of Op Unifier? Is that... uh, yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. And I, I know you and I have talked about the notion that in many ways this is a brand new one because, of course, the, the, the war is very much underway and that the, the capacity is expanded. But what do you want Canadians to know about what has been a long-standing mission that predated the current war to get Ukrainian soldiers the skills that many NATO armies would have? What, what, what do you want Canadians to know about Canada's effort in places like Poland, where I speak to you, and, and in the UK, where more Canadians are training Ukrainians? The value and the meaning that not only I, but the remainder of the task force has in this mission is monumental and and i say that without exaggeration the the mission here is really supporting and is is acting on what i would consider the bulwark or the the extreme flank of nato and the rules-based international order everything that we are doing here has a direct impact on the current situation and the combat operations that are occurring in the Donbass, in Zaporizhia, Mikolaev, mm -hmm. anything that is occurring on the front is, is directly related to the effort that we're undertaking here. There's no nebulous um, concept and the national security, um, not only of Canada, but of Europe is really at stake here. And, and I think I need to highlight that and underscore that because this is this conflict now as you've stated has been ongoing in various various manners for we're, we're bordering a decade now mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. this time where the international community has really stood together and said this has to end and restoring sovereignty of ukrainian territory is of the utmost primacy we'll need to leave our conversation there lieutenant colonel chris Boileau, thank you very much for your time today well thank you very much david i appreciate your time